Before I read the scripture, I would like you to turn to someone close to you and let them know how blessed you are because they're here this morning. I'll be reading from Luke chapter 12, verses 13 through 24. Then one from the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man who made me a judge over an arbitrator over you. And he said to them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of things he possesses. Then he spoke a parable to them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man yielded plentiful, and though within himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there I will store all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? So is he who lays up treasures for himself and is not rich toward God. Then he said to the disciples, Therefore I say to you, Do not worry about your life, what you will eat, nor about your body, what you will put on. Life is more than food, and the body is more than clothing. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which they have neither storehouse nor barn, and God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? That's Luke 12, 13 through 24. As I looked at this text uh, these past weeks, uh, it just struck a special note to me, even personally. You know that every day of our lives we are being pulled in a number of different directions, aren't we? Every day. On one hand, we have family responsibilities pulling us one way. Our obligations to the church pulling us another way. And friends Pull us another way. We are left wondering, what is really important in life? Let me say that again. What is really important in life? The passage that we were going to examine today that was read in Luke forces us to make a decision about what kind of life do we want? Do you want a life dependent on things of this world? Or a life with no guarantee of any of the world's goods, but close to God. This passage is very relevant to us today because most people in America, the main priority for us, most people in America, in life, is to obtain enough of money to live a good and wonderful life. We are bombarded on televisions and many other avenues, which shows like... I know on television, this shows uh, that says this, Lives of the Rich and Famous, maybe you've seen that one, or Fabulous Wealthy Hideaways. Today, no matter what one possesses, think of this, someone else has something bigger, something better, or even different, especially in American society, the Distance between comfortable and covetous may not be that great. See, Jesus is in the middle of a sermon of this text, teaching his disciples to fear God alone. When he is suddenly interrupted by a man 
who is dissatisfied over what he considered to be an unfair division of his father's estate. Right? You remember he were hearing that part of the text? Between himself and his brother. I find it oddly comforting that even the Lord Jesus Christ could not keep everyone's attention. One such man says in verse 13, if you have your Bible open to our text, says, Teacher, tell my brother to divide his inheritance with me. Down through history, there have been many, many families that have been destroyed over a thing as simple as a distribution of asset, assets. In one family, a, a grandfather became angry over the way his mother's estate was divided. And he did not speak to his brothers for years and years or ever again. This man really didn't ask Jesus for a decision on what would be fair division of the state. He just demanded, tell my brother to divide their inheritance with me. Jesus did not answer as he was expected to. So if you look at verse 14, he says to the man, man who made me a judge or an arbiter, over you. See, Jesus refused to be sidetracked from his mission of seeking to save the lost. Instead, Jesus does not make a legal judgment, but a moral one. See, Jesus knew that this family feud over inheritance was only a symptom of a greater problem of greed. In fact, the word you in verse 14 is plural, indicating that both brothers have a problem with greed. As long as both brothers are suffering from greed, no settlement would be satisfactory. Jesus tells them that the most important thing is not for him to solve his problem, but that his heart, that his heart should be changed. But if we are honest... How often have we gone to God asking him to change our situation rather than asking him to change our hearts? I would dare say that most of our prayers are that God would solve a problem in our lives. Perhaps our prayer should be, God, here is my problem. Please change my heart. Then in verse 15, take a look at it. And he said to them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. You get that? When he says, Take heed and beware, he literally saying, Be on guard against all kinds of greed. The area of danger for this man was greed or covetousness. And it means the lust to have more than one's fair share a grasping for more that is never satisfied to him. Or to put it another way, covetous is wanting more of what you already have enough of. That's what he's talking about. In Proverbs chapter 21, verse 26, speaks of this very problem when it says, they are always greedy for more, while the godly love is to give. The writer of Ecclesiastics says about the greedy in chapter 5, verse 10, where it says this, Those who love money will never have enough. How absurd to think that wealth brings true happiness. I think we got a little wrong here in America. But is that not exactly what we think here in America? How many of us think if we could just win Oh, if we just win the publisher's clearinghouse sweepstakes or the New York lottery ticket, we can just win, we could live the good life. Charles Swindoll has pictured it this way. Picture a shipwrecked sailor on a life raft. And he's out there in the middle of the ocean. He's terrible thirsty. And it impels him, he's so thirsty, to drink the salt water. But it only makes him what? More thirsty. This causes him to drink even more. Which makes him thirstier still. 
He consumes more and more of the salty water until he becomes dehydrated and he dies. See, Jesus now then addresses what we can term the folly of seeking the comfortable life. See, one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Most people have that all wrong. But greed tries to convince us just the opposite, doesn't it? That life does not consist in what we own. Remember that. Malcolm Ford, you remember him, merely reflected on our society when he said, the one who dies with the most toys, what? Wins. Mr. Forbes has since passed away, and he now knows that this is not true. Beginning in verse 16, looking at our text of what is referred as the parable of the rich fool that was read to you, in which the Lord gives five principles of what happens when our hearts are focused exclusively on ourselves. The first one, when our hearts are focused on ourselves, we do not give God the credit for things he has done. Look at verse 16, look what it says. Then he spoke a parable to them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. And then this parable is addressed to the multitude, for it says that Jesus spoke this parable to them. That's plural, to all people. Underline the word plural if you have it in your Bible. I think that it is important to note that this parable does not condemn this man for being rich. And to his credit, it would appear that this man had come by his wealth honestly. The rich man of this parable was a farmer, but he represents all human beings when you read this parable. You and I. Who are seduced by all kinds of greed. As this farmer looked at his amazing harvest, he did not see the hand of God in it. He saw only his own effort. Yet he is a perfect example of greed because he has much and he expects to get more and more. And then secondly, when our hearts are focused on ourselves, we make plans but leave God totally out. Look at verses 17 and 18 of the text. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do since I have no room to store my crops? Verse 18 says, So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater and greater, and there I will store all my crops and my goods. Now, there is nothing wrong with this desire to build more barns. It was both wise and prudent. See, the problem lays in the fact that there is no thought of Sharing. Not one, whatever. In the original Greek, the personal pronoun my occurs four times and I eight times. Even in the English, we see the, pro, the pronoun I five times and my four times. Notice how he says my crops, my barns, my goods. He is confused between ownership and stewardship. It is not ours to own. It is ours to loan. Then thirdly, when our hearts are focused on ourselves, we consider spending our resources only on ourselves. Look at verse 19 of our text. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. So when you look in this verse, although he addresses himself as soul, it is a physical life that he's really concerned about. This man thought that when he put his plan into being, that he would have to make these plans for years to come. But all of this is based on the fact that this man expected to control the fate of his future crops. He envisions a future as continually expanding and growing under his control. But nothing could be further from the truth. In the book of James, speaks to just 
an attitude. If you went to James chapter 4, starting verse 13 through 16, it says, when he says, come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we'll go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell and make a profit, whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? Is he, it, it, it is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this and that. But now you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So the Bible does not discourage us from looking to the future with great expectation. It doesn't say anything against that. However, as we make our plans, whether we're in business or in relationships or in our own personal lives, we are to do so from the ultimate purpose that God is the one in charge, not us. In other words, we need to plan with humility. You know, I wonder what this says about our American concept of retirement even. I'm not against retirement. I would like to be able to do that someday. But perhaps God would have us to look at it differently than we do. I thought that, but perhaps to see it as a time when we have more free income and greater time on our hands and than ever before to do something for the kingdom of God. We have more time to do that. And then fourthly, when our hearts are focused on ourselves, we store our treasures in the wrong places. We do. Look at verse 20 of our text. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? Now, this man is pronounced what? A fool. It says fool by God. See, a fool in biblical language is not a description of mental ability, but a spiritual discernment. According to scripture, a fool is a man who leaves God out of any considerations at all. Psalm 14, verse 1 says, The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. This man is a fool not because he said that this, but because he has lived his life as if God didn't even exist. He is a fool in that he did not recognize that his material possessions came from where? God. Yours has, mine has. It came from God for us to do what with? Help others? Nor did he recognize any obligation to God in the use of his possessions. See, fools leave God out of their lives. Truly they do. Greed is the logical result of the belief that there is no life after death. We grab what we can while we can, however we can, and then hold on to them as hard as we can. That's what we do. Leroy Tolstoy once wrote a story about a successful peasant farmer who was not satisfied with his lot. He wanted more and more of everything. And one day he received this novel offer from somebody for a thousand rubles. All more money than we can think of, probably. He could buy all the land he could walk around in a day. The only catch in the deal was that he had to be back at his starting point at sundown. Early the next morning, he started out walking at his fast pace. By midday then, he was very tired, but he kept going, covering more and more ground while into the afternoon he realized his, that his greed had taken him far from the starting point. He quickened his pace as the sun began to sink low in the sky. Then he began to run, 
knowing that if he did not make it back by sundown, the opportunity to become even bigger landlord, richer man, would be lost. As the sun began to sink below the horizon, he came within sight of the finish line. Oh, there it is right ahead. Grasping for breath, his heart pounding, he called upon every bit of strength left in his body and staggered across the line just before the sun disappeared. He immediately collapsed, blood streaming from his mouth, and in a few minutes, he was dead. So afterwards, his servants dug a grave. It was not much over six feet long and three foot wide. See, the title of, the, of this story was, How Much Land Does a Man Need? Get the point? To be a fool is to have missed the point of life. So many of us do that. The remarkable thing is that this person that God calls a fool, we would very often call a success. Look how successful those people are. They got everything. Jesus says, this very night, your soul will be demanded of you. Wow. The Greek verb translated required or demand literally means to demand back or require back. Conveying the idea of life as a loan that must be repaid to God upon demand. He goes on in the second half of verse 21. 20, I'm sorry, verse 20. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? See, long before the great philosopher Solomon made comment on this very problem in Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 2, starting verse 21 to 23, you can write this reference in your Margin your Bible, Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verses 21 23. He says this for, th- for though I do not, for though I do my work with wisdom, knowledge, and skill, I must leave everything I gain to people who haven't worked to earn it. This is not only foolish, but highly unfair. So, what do people get for all their hard work? Their days of labor are filled with pain and grief. Even at night, they cannot rest. It is utterly meaningless. Listen, since you cannot take it with you, there's no need to wear ourselves out accumulating it, is it? You can't take it with you. Everything you have will one day be left behind. Think of that. It's yours now to use or to abuse. But one day it will be taken from you and you will stand before the Lord and give an account to him on how you used it, what he gave you. We lose, we lose sight of that. It'd be well to remember the, the words of missionary Jim Elliot at this point. He said, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain which he cannot lose. Then the fifth one is, when our hearts are focused on ourselves, we'll find ourselves in conflict with God's plan for our lives. Because look what it says in verse 21. So is he who lays up treasures for himself and is not rich toward God. See, riches to me have have one major weakness. They have no purchasing power after death. Not at all. The rich rewards, God's, are those who use what God has given him for others. That's really what it's all about. There is numerous examples in Scripture. People such as the centurion, 
who built a synagogue for the people in worship in Luke chapter 7. And how about the home of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, where Jesus often found rest? They were rich toward God. See, the, the way to become rich toward God is to invest in his church, in his lives, in his people. But don't misunderstand me. It's not that the church, if I use the example of the church, that the church needs your resources in order to survive. But that generosity will add in richness to your life that you would otherwise miss. You, both, we all miss the richness of God and the blessings of God when we do something for others. Of the gifts that God's given us. Think of that. I wish uh, Yvonne's here. Yvonne, stand up for a minute, please. Yvonne's here, and she had a partner, Nancy Volus. And one day I was outside, and here comes a truck, backed up, with two wonderful ladies there, loaded with sawdust. To put in my barn. And they unloaded that whole big truck. Norm filled it up, up at his mill, but I was overwhelmed with the blessing of them giving of the Lord their time, their service to help someone. What a, I never had such a blessing and just overwhelmed my wife and I, and I think about it every day. That's just a little example of what things can be done. I know other people do things, but that's the point with being taught here in God's word. We begin this study by noting that daily we are pulled in many different directions and left wondering, what is really, really important in life? What is really important in life? The answer is found in verse 21. Life in spite of all its complexities can be reduced to a very simple decision. And this is what it is. Are you going to live life for yourself? Or are you going to live life toward God? What's your choice? What's your choice? Father, we thank you so much for your holy word that we can open up and and read. As we looked at the parable of the rich fool and the teaching you had for everyone of all ages. And Lord, that we would stop saying, that's mine, that's mine, that's mine. And realize, no, it's yours, Father. They're gifts from you for us to use to glorify your name. May we never forget that, that we store our treasures in heaven, that the gifts you've given us, we share with others. What a blessing that will be for all of us. And I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, we'll all turn in our hymnals to 493. It is well with my soul. There's something you have to do first. (laughs) Give it all to Jesus. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when 
sorrows like sea billows roll. Whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. My soul, with my soul, it is well. It is well with my soul. Though Satan should buffet, though trial should come, let this bless assurance control. That Christ has regarded my helpless estate and has shed his own blood for my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul, with my soul. It is well, it is well. With my soul, my sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious day, Lord. My sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O oh my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul, with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. And Lord, haste the day. When my faith shall be sight, the clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trump shall resound, and the Lord shall descend. Even so, it is well with my soul. my soul, with my soul, it is well, it is well, with my soul. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. At this time, we'll take our gift of love offering. 